Thank you, brothers. How reassuring to know that we always have Jehovah's support. We now invite you to stand and sing song number two entitled, Jehovah is your name. After the song, there will be an announcement, and if you wish, you may remain standing. Again, that's song number two. Jehovah's arrangement for feeding us spiritually includes the preparation and distribution of programs such as this one. Those who wish to assist with the expenses for these provisions may donate online at donate.jw.org. You may be seated. We have now come to the concluding talk of this assembly. All day we have seen that true joy comes from knowing Jehovah God. How can we keep Jehovah at the center of our thoughts? Please give your attention to Brother David Schaefer as he concludes our assembly with the talk, Keep Jehovah Before You Constantly. Have you had to learn new methods of communicating these past few months? Teleconferencing, group chats, as well as texting and writing letters and emails are all useful, and we're grateful that we can still keep in touch with friends, relatives, workmates, and we'll keep using these methods as long as necessary. But it's just not the same as being together, is it? However, there is one relationship that has not changed. It's remained constant. In fact, it may even be stronger now than ever before. It's certainly more important now than ever. It's the most precious relationship we have, keeping Jehovah before us constantly. It brings joy both now and forever. In this discussion, we're going to center on how to keep Jehovah in our thoughts and actions, not just at specific times, such as when we go to meetings or say prayers, but as we go about our activities each day. Now first though, how do we know that there's a link between joy and centering our attention on Jehovah constantly? Turn with me, please, to the 16th Psalm, where we find the key scripture for this talk, Psalm 16. You see from the superscription that this psalm was written by David. Now notice how he describes his feelings and why he has them. Psalm 16, beginning in verse 8. I keep Jehovah before me constantly, because he is at my right hand, I will never be shaken. Now, what do you suppose he means, Jehovah is at my right hand? Well, David fought the battles for Jehovah. And usually warriors carried a sword in their right hand and a shield in their left. And, and that meant that uh, their right hand was in need of extra defenses that could only be provided by someone else. David was convinced that as he kept Jehovah's will foremost in his thoughts and actions, Jehovah would protect him. And the result, well, notice verse 9. So, the result, so my heart rejoices and my whole being is joyful and I reside in security. My whole being is joyful, he said. Why did David feel that way? Because of his constant focus on and confidence in Jehovah. Well, now, you might recall that not everything in Psalm 16 pertains to David himself. Now look, for instance, at verse 10. For you will not leave me in the grave you will not allow your loyal one to see the pit. And remember that at Pentecost 33 CE, the Apostle Peter applied all of these words, Psalm 16, 8 through 11, to none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, showing that whereas David died and was buried, Jesus was not forsaken in the grave because Jehovah resurrected him. The point for us, dear friends, is this. As foreshadowed in the 16th Psalm, Jesus 
was keen to please his father. And that focus brought Jesus abundant joy and eternal happiness, as Psalm 1611 also mentions. And we too can find joy if we imitate Jesus' example. Now especially, living as we are in this age of distraction and change, how do we keep Jehovah in our thoughts constantly as we go about our daily activities? We want to consider four ways today that we can do that. First, by paying attention to Jehovah's creation. Second, by keeping our minds fixed on God's inspired word. Third, by keeping close to Jehovah in prayer. And fourth, by choosing friends who also keep Jehovah before themselves constantly. We're going to discuss how Jesus did that, how we can do that, and how all of that relates to joy. Let's begin at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Please turn there as we contemplate our first way to keep Jehovah in mind, namely by paying attention to his creation. Now, how does creation help us to focus on Jehovah? It's not automatic. Romans 1.20 shows us the process. Notice, for his invisible qualities are clearly seen from the world's creation onward because they are perceived by the things made, even his eternal power and godship, so that they are inexcusable. Yes, the things made reveal Jehovah's qualities, but we have to pay attention in order to perceive the qualities, to see beyond the creation to the creator. For instance, Jehovah's wisdom can be seen in the animal creation. What is your favorite bird to watch in flight? Is it a, a row of pelicans flying in a straight line low, just a few feet above the surf? Or the amazing aerial maneuvers of swallows? Or how about the albatross? With its 11-foot wingspan, it can glide for years without landing. Seriously. In their lifetime, they can fly between two and three million miles. That's like making five trips to the moon and back. What's the fastest bird? That depends on what you're measuring. The peregrine falcon has been clocked at 217 miles per hour. On the other hand, the diving hummingbird can reach speeds of almost 400 body lengths per second. Uh, but this means that when pulling up at the end of its dive, the bird is subject to a force ten times that of gravity. A pilot, a human pilot, would quickly go unconscious under the same circumstances. Or much could be said about birds' amazing ability to communicate. Each of the thousands of species of birds has its own unique voice and vocabulary. The chickadee can make 50 distinct sounds that communicate important phrases like, I'm hungry, or I'm afraid of that hawk. The chickadee is named after its danger call. Maybe you've heard one when you're out for a walk. Chickadee, dee, 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 dee. The more dees, the greater the danger it senses. And researchers have discovered that the nuthatch will actually eavesdrop on chickadee warning calls and retweet them to their neighbors. A National Geographic recently reported on new research that suggests that the nuthatch will repeat only the general alarm at first. They won't vocalize the more specific information until, the pred until they can uh, verify the truth about the predator. <laughs> Elihu said, as recorded at Job 35:11, that Jehovah makes us wiser than the flying creatures of the heavens. Well, hopefully we are wiser when it comes to repeating unsubstantiated information. But do you make the effort to perceive Jehovah's wisdom in the animal creation or consider Jehovah's power? Isaiah chapter 40 verse 26 shows how the stars testify to Jehovah's vast dynamic energy and his awe-inspiring power. What's your favorite star? Our sun is an average-sized star. How much energy does it radiate? Imagine how intense a fire would have to be 
if you could stand 10 miles away from it and still feel its heat. Well, our sun is 93 million miles away, and yet it can blister our skin. And only a billionth of its energy actually reaches our Earth. And yet that's enough to sustain life on our planet. A billionth of the energy of just one star. And yet when you look up at night, you're seeing thousands of stars, each effusing vast amounts of energy. And there are billions upon billions more that we can't see with the unaided eye. Wisdom and power. How about Jehovah's justice? Can you think of a creation that reveals Jehovah's justice? Think about your immune system. Yes, we've been thinking a lot about our immune systems lately. The journal Scientific American said, quote, from before birth until death, the immune system is in a state of constant alert. A diverse array of molecules and cells protects us against parasites and pathogens. Without those defenses, humans could not survive. End of the quote. Well, what do you perceive from this about our Creator, who provides such a remarkable immune system for rich and poor alike? Clearly, Jehovah is wise and just and fair. But how about his dominant quality of love? You can perceive it in everything Jehovah has made, but let's give attention to just one aspect of creation that highlights Jehovah's love, a mother's tender care. Who originated the family? Who invented the mother? Who crafted the human endocrine system in such a way that during birth, mothers experience elevated levels of the hormone oxytocin, uh, which is believed to play a role in the urge to act in a loving and self-sacrificing way? Who made people that way? Genesis 127 says that we were created in God's image. So a mother's love teaches us about Jehovah's great love. What kind of a personality, what kind of mind did it take not only to bring all of these things into existence, but to sustain them for millenniums? As Romans 1.20 says, we have evidence not only of Jehovah's invisible qualities and his eternal power, but his Godship. Jehovah is truly God. He alone is worthy of our worship perceive the connection between the things made and the Creator. Now, do you recall how Jesus set an example in this? Uh, where did Jesus choose to give his sermon on the mount? On the mount. On a mountain near Capernaum that sloped down toward the Sea of Galilee. And what did he talk about? Among other things, creation, lilies of the field, straw, fruit trees, birds of the heavens, fish, snakes, moths, pigs, dogs, sheep and wolves, salt of the earth, stones, sun, rain, wind, and sand. Jesus used the creation to teach about the Creator. If this is how God clothes the vegetation of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much rather clothe you? If this is how Jehovah takes care of birds, will he not much rather feed you? If this is how Jehovah provides sun and rain, impartially, both to wicked people and to good, can we not imitate this quality of his? Well, can we not imitate Jesus in this kind of meditation and teaching. Why not take your family study outside once in a while? Plan a trip to the backyard. Teach lessons from what surrounds you. This was actually recommended in our Kingdom Ministry of January 2011. Page 6 contained a box entitled, Some Ideas for Family Worship Evening, with 24 suggestions. But now, in practical terms, how would you do that? Well, you could compare a fruit tree to a local factory. To highlight Jehovah's wisdom, you could point out that the fruit tree creates no air pollution. To the contrary, it cleans the air. And to highlight Jehovah's hospitality, you could point out that Jehovah makes abundant fruit, each containing a seed so that future generations can enjoy it. And by the way, does Jehovah even eat fruit? 
No, he has made all of these things for our benefit and pleasure. Uh, by contrast, a local factory emits pollution and noise and then requires payment for its products. How superior Jehovah's wisdom and hospitality are. Jehovah generously provides so many things for our enjoyment. Meditating on his qualities as revealed in creation helps us and our families draw closer to him. And speaking of family study, a turn please to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And let's talk about that second way that we keep Jehovah before us constantly. Jehovah speaks to us through his inspired word, the Bible. The question is, what do we do with these words once we read them? Notice what it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. It says, these words that I am commanding you today must be on your heart, and you must inculcate them in your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as a reminder on your hand, and they must be like a headband on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, while those words apply to training children, they apply to everyone who wants to keep Jehovah in mind constantly. We need to know Jehovah's commands by heart. More importantly, we want to know the person. Yes, he says, avoid this, do that. But why? Why? requires meditation. Meditate on Jehovah's Word frequently throughout the day, not just during periods of personal study. Deuteronomy 6.8 says, tie these inspired words on your hand. Hands represent actions. So if Jehovah's law is tied to our hands, it means that we are obedient to Jehovah, doing work that he approves because we love him. And Jehovah's law was also to be like a, a headband on their forehead. A reminder tied to your hand is something that you always see, but a headband on your forehead is something others always see. They can't miss it. In like manner, Jehovah's law should constitute our identity visible to all at all times, whether we're at home, on the road, or near the city gates where elders handled legal cases. And as it says at the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6, before we can motivate others, Jehovah's word must be on our heart. So reflect on how Jehovah's word can guide you in everyday situations. Jesus did that. Let's re-examine the notable account at Matthew chapter 4. Remember what Jesus did when he was tempted by the devil. He immediately thought of scriptures that applied to his situation. When the devil tempted Jesus to turn stones into loaves of bread, Jesus refused to use his power to satisfy personal desires. But why? He said, as recorded at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, man must live... First, he said, it is written, man must live not on bread alone, but on every word that comes from Jehovah's mouth, quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. And we often use that as an example of how we too should use scriptures when making decisions or resisting temptations. But drill deeper. Scriptures are more than just excerpts from a law book. They teach us about Jehovah's personality. Look for the action, and you'll learn about the person. So let's take this scripture that Jesus quoted as an example, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. What was the context, the significance of those words? Jehovah's provision of the manna. Manna, making a provision for manna, was an action, something Jehovah did. What does the action teach you about the person? Well, what gave rise to the manna provision? Complaint. The Israelites were hungry. They were at wit's end. They started remembering the food they enjoyed in Egypt, and they started complaining against Moses and Aaron. 
So what did Jehovah do? He gave them not just food, but obedient food, food that taught lessons. This was food that always did what Jehovah said it would do. So they had to pick it up according to Jehovah's instructions. If they took more than they could eat in a day, it bred worms and stank. Uh, but on the sixth day, that was different. If they didn't collect twice as much on the sixth day, then they went hungry on the seventh day. On the other hand, the manna stored in a jar inside of the Ark of the Covenant at Jehovah's command remained for decades without breeding worms. It was by this remarkable food that Jehovah taught the people that the situation that they were in was not about bread. It was about confidence in the giver of life and trust in his promises. That is the power behind the principle. Jesus didn't need to worry about food. His trust was in his Father, whose love is constant, whose word is certain. So it wasn't just, here's an excerpt from a law book, but implicit faith in a loving Father who cannot lie. All of that wrapped up in Deuteronomy 8.3. But the devil used that confidence against Jesus. You want to Play, quote that scripture. Here's one, Psalm 91, 11 and 12. So throw yourself down off this high wall and let's see the angel come to your rescue. But again, Jesus used Deuteronomy 6, 16, as stated at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 7. Again, it is written, you must not put Jehovah your God to the test. Then the devil offered him all the kingdoms of the world and their power, and Jesus flatly refused, but not without a Bible principle. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, It is Jehovah your God you must worship, and it is to him alone you must render sacred service. Again, drawing from Deuteronomy, possibly combining thoughts from three different texts. Jesus kept Jehovah in mind constantly, and on that account, he resisted the tempter throughout his life, and his heart was cheerful, and he resided in hope. Well, we can do that too, and that's the point. As we go about our daily activity, reflect on how Jehovah's word can guide us. Here we are, going through a pandemic. Ask yourself, why am I stuck here during this lockdown when others seem to be out there enjoying life? Why do I have to wear a mask when I'm around people? What's the Bible principle? 1 Corinthians 10, 24, let each one keep seeking not his own advantage, but that of the other person. Why am I writing all these letters and making phone calls to strangers? There may be a number of texts that come to your mind. Romans 10, 14, how will they hear? without someone to preach. Mark 13, 10, in all the nations, the good news has to be preached. Or the two greatest commandments, love Jehovah your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. But go deeper. Where is the action of Jehovah in all of these texts? What does it teach you about Jehovah's personality? Keep Jehovah in front of you constantly. Why am I avoiding unwholesome entertainment? The principles. Psalm 11, 5. Jehovah hates anyone loving violence. Ephesians 5, 3. Let uncleanness and greediness not even be mentioned among you, just as it befits holy people. Now they're pressuring me at work to join in protest. They say silence is consent. That seems like a sound principle. Of course, I don't consent to cruelty. So what's my response? Isaiah 11, 3 and 4, I support a government that's completely just and fair, one that can actually ensure justice for all. For every course in life, a Bible principle. Behind the principle is an action. In the action, we see the personality of Jehovah. Look for it. Living by these principles is our identity. God's law is tied as a reminder on our hand and worn as a headband on our forehead. Jesus did that. We can do that. 
Now, this kind of careful study of Jehovah's Word will also help us with our third way of keeping Jehovah before us constantly, and that is keeping close to Jehovah in prayer. Now, turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Prayer is Jehovah's provision for us to speak to him. Are you convinced that Jehovah is the hearer of prayer, as he's called at Psalm 65.2? Some people think that prayer is only of psychological benefit. They claim that if you think your prayer is answered, it's just because you put your thoughts into words, identified your problem, and set your mind on finding a solution. But is that all there is to it? How did Jesus feel about prayer? For thousands of years before he came to the earth, Jesus watched firsthand as his father answered countless prayers. And then here he was on earth using that very same means of communication. Would he have done so if he thought Jehovah wasn't really listening? Would he have taught his disciples how to pray if he thought it was just a mental trick? Jesus knew that prayer is real. He said, as recorded at John 11, 41 and 42, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. True, I knew that you always hear me. You always hear me. We too have confidence that Jehovah is the hearer of prayer and the answerer of prayer. And when we're specific in our prayers, we become more keenly aware of those answers, even if they may be subtle. The more you express your innermost concerns to Jehovah, the closer he will draw to you. Now notice the exhortation we find here in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Do not be anxious over anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, along with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. Now notice that it first says, in everything. Well, what does that include? It includes anything that affects our relationship with Jehovah or our life as one of his servants. So a change of employment affects our life as Jehovah's servants, our ability to care for our families, spiritual and physical needs. Moving to another city or country would obviously have an impact on your life as one of Jehovah's servants. It could impact the lives of many others, both in the place you leave and the place you go. It could be a positive step, but it could also have significant dangers. But what about your approach to an assignment in the congregation or in the organization or your relationships with others? How will you carry out your ministry? Perhaps you need help in your marriage, help raising your children or adapting to the death of the mate or the unfaithfulness of a mate. Now we're facing challenges related to the virus, quarantine, sheltering in place, isolation, integrating back into society. And of course, we're concerned about all of these things, not just for ourselves, but for others who may be facing these same challenges and yet worse ones. For instance, persecution, imprisonment, ban, natural disasters. All of these things have a direct bearing on our relationship with Jehovah. And let's not forget everything mentioned in the Bible. Is there something in the Bible that you wish you understood better? Make it a matter of prayer. Proverbs 2, 3 through 5 says, call out for understanding and you will find the knowledge of God. So the list of things that we can pray about is endless. Thus, Philippians 4, 6 says, everything. Next, Paul mentions three forms of prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, and petition. Supplication suggests a heartfelt, earnest entreaty, begging Jehovah for help. What might be an example of that? A turn, please, to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Jesus, of course, is our primary example of one who kept Jehovah before him constantly in prayer. Notice what it says here at Hebrews 5, 7 about supplication. It says, during his life on earth, Christ offered up supplications, plural, and also petitions with strong outcries and tears to the one who was able to save him out of death and he was favorably heard for his godly fear. Supplications, 
plural. Jesus implored Jehovah fervently, repeatedly in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this kind of prayer is prayer with intense feeling. Uh, Life is at stake or the lives of others. Even the topics addressed in the model prayer can be matters for our intense supplication. When we think about what's happening on this earth, surely we should pray with intensity that Jehovah's name be sanctified and that his kingdom rid this earth of Satan's rule. Now, if Jesus had to supplicate repeatedly with strong outcries and tears, how much more so do we? Paul next mentions along with thanksgiving. The list of things that we can thank Jehovah for is endless. We can thank him for the many things that delight our hearts each day, not just the abundant food and clean water, but the creative wonder, the variety in plants and animals. It's hard to imagine a color in which Jehovah has not provided a bird. We can thank him for all of these things, and yet even in difficult times, we should always thank Jehovah. Acts chapter 16 verses 22 through 25 describes how Paul and Silas were attacked by a mob, arrested, beaten with rods, thrown into prison, and fastened with their feet in the stocks. And yet, what were they doing in the middle of the night? Singing. Singing. Praying and praising God with song, it says. Well, we have many examples today of people undergoing extreme pressure, and yet they're grateful. Maybe you noticed that piece on JW.org about the 18 disaster relief committees in Brazil assisting our brothers affected by the economic challenges resulting from the coronavirus, and that includes our brothers and sisters living deep in the isolated Amazon River region. Now, Sister Mari Nelma, who lives in the Lago do Castanjo region, said that after receiving her food supplies, our need here was great, as we had no way to buy food. My six-year-old son saw me unpacking and arranging the provisions, and I took the opportunity to explain that Jehovah used the brothers to help us. Then my little boy said, Mom, could we say a prayer to thank Jehovah Gratitude. Gratitude helps us keep Jehovah first. And next, Philippians 4, 6 concludes with the words, Let your petitions be made known to God. These are requests. We can freely ask Jehovah for anything in harmony with his will. Anything. Petitions are important of course. But notice that in this scripture, they're mentioned last. Even in the Lord's Prayer, our personal needs are mentioned last. And this is also borne out in the prayer of the Levites recorded at Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 5 through 38. So this is a lengthy prayer. And we can learn many things from this prayer. You remember remember this uh, summer we enjoyed the Nehemiah drama at our regional convention televised on JW Broadcasting. And perhaps you remember the beautiful scene at the very beginning of part two where the Levites and the people were gathered for instruction in Jehovah's law and to confess their sins. These were the events of Nehemiah chapter eight. Now the events of chapter nine are not depicted in the drama, but they happened on the exact same occasion. Now, a great way to enjoy this chapter is to play it from the audio Bible. You can do that in JW Library just by tapping the little headphone icon. The recording begins with a characterization of Nehemiah's voice, but then the chapter continues with eight different voices offering this beautiful prayer in turns as a sort of symposium. In this prayer, the Levites recount the nation's history with particular focus on the good hand of Jehovah. Then they confess the nation's lack of appreciation for how Jehovah led them. Only down toward the end of that prayer, in verse 32, do we find one brief expression that we could classify as a request or a petition. What can we learn from all of this? that there is a clear connection between meditating on Jehovah's inspired word 
and offering meaningful prayers. Use supplication, thanksgiving, petition to keep Jehovah in mind at all times and concerning everything. But now let's talk about our fourth point, and that is choosing friends who keep Jehovah before themselves constantly. We're forced to live in Satan's world, which ignores Jehovah. Uh, nevertheless, we can find friends who keep Jehovah in mind at all times. Back in the 16th Psalm, uh, notice what David said about his associates. You can use your history button in JW Library. Just tap and hold your little Bible icon. Uh, we're looking for Psalm 16, 3. Psalm 16, 3. And the holy ones in the earth, the majestic ones, bring me great delight. David knew the secret of finding true friends. He found great delight in associating with holy ones, those who were morally clean and upright. Uh, you too can find many good friends among those who fear Jehovah and obey him and put him first in their lives. Can you recall the name of a majestic one who was a dear friend of David? How about Jonathan, son of King Saul? He was about 30 years older than David, and there's a good lesson for us in that. We don't need to restrict our circle of friends to uh, our, our peers alone. Uh, David and Saul respected, or rather David and Jonathan, respected one another deeply because each observed how the other trusted in Jehovah when they were fighting against his enemies. That was the basis for one of the most beautiful friendships recorded in Scripture. First Samuel chapter 23, verse 16 shows that when David was in danger, Jonathan helped him find strength in Jehovah. He even risked his life for David, and David was a loyal friend too. He promised to take care of Jonathan's family, and he kept that promise even after Jonathan died. At the same time, we need to avoid close friendship with those who allow themselves to be influenced by this wicked, wicked world. Uh, David wrote, as recorded at Psalm 139, verses 21 and 22, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Jehovah, and loathe those who revolt against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. They have become real enemies to me. And we feel that way too. Why? Because our friendship with Jehovah is the most precious relationship we have. The most precious thing we have. It, it's more valuable than life itself. So we avoid being close friends with anyone who could weaken our faith and damage that relationship. Jesus too chose friends who put Jehovah first. He spent a whole night in prayer deliberating over who would be his closest associates, a decision that had everlasting ramifications. Now, these weren't perfect men. Later, Jesus dismissed Judas. He also had to correct the 11 others who sometimes gave in to bad traits. But these were loyal men, men who loved Jehovah, like David, like Jesus, we too find great delight in loving those who love Jehovah and who show their faith in him. How do you feel when you learn about people in your own congregation who took a stand for Jehovah in school or at work? Or maybe you recall working with them out in the ministry and hearing how they expressed their faith or handled a particularly challenging door and yet really honored Jehovah in the process. Doesn't it just draw you closer to that person and make you proud to have him or her as your friend? Well, maybe you're thinking to yourself, it was sure a lot easier to make new friends before all of this physical distancing mandate. True. Uh, but there are things that we can do to start and maintain friendships. Uh, and remember that what we're talking about here is keeping Jehovah before us constantly. So what we're looking for is how Jehovah is at work in the lives of his friends. And when we have that focus, we listen to our friends carefully, listening 
for how Jehovah is blessing them. It may even be that by pointing out these facts to your friends, you help them to see things about their own relationship that they may have taken for granted or didn't fully recognize. And just as we can listen carefully to people that we can see, so we can do with people that we only read about in our magazines or uh, see interviewed on JW Broadcasting. That is a great way to get to know our global brotherhood. Pay attention to how Jehovah is strengthening his friends and protecting their relationship with him. Now, if you want to speed that process up a little bit, you can go to your Watchtower Library search field and type these words, Jehovah helped me. Jehovah helped me, or Jehovah helped us. And then select sentence scope. By adding a personal pronoun like me or us, you can narrow your search down to personal experiences. Uh, one article that such a search would bring up is Jehovah Helped Me Meet Life's Challenges, the story of Brother Dale Irwin in the Watchtower of October 1st, 2006, pages 11 through 15. Young Australian brother starts pioneering, gets accepted to Bethel, marries, and then enters the circuit work. But by the time he's 47 years old, he finds himself the father of eight the last four being quadruplets. Fascinating turns of events. Even the newspapers reported on it. But the real story is, how did Jehovah help this family? Why was this article published in the Watchtower announcing Jehovah's kingdom? Because it gives evidence of what Jehovah is doing in modern times, in the life of his friends. Look for that. Look for it every time you meet one of your brother's or sisters, either in person, in a breakout room, in an article, or on a broadcast. It's easy to get a little downhearted while we're sheltering in place, but then we watched the 2020 Governing Body Report number 5, which included the interviews of our two sisters in Russia, Tatyana and Olga, who had their homes invaded and then spent eight months behind bars, 245 days for their faith. It gave us perspective, didn't it? And it wasn't just a matter of, oh, you think you have it bad, well, just listen to this. No, it was testimony to how they sensed the good hand of Jehovah helped them deal with the trials that they were experiencing. That is priceless. Recall that Tatiana Shamsheva said that Jehovah is very sensitive to our needs. And at times like that, he draws close to us in a unique way. Now turn with me, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. What would you say, dear friends? How can we constantly keep before us something that we cannot see? The answer is by looking more deeply at the things we can see things Jehovah created, the fulfilled promise of God, answers to our prayers, and people who are spiritually strong because of what Jehovah has done for them. Be on the lookout for that, because it will help us to do what we are admonished to do here in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. Keep your minds fixed fixed on the things above, not on the things on the earth. Satan wants us to think about the things on the earth. And he has filled the earth with false reasonings, worldly philosophies, materialistic attitudes. And frankly, sometimes those things could appeal to our imperfect fleshly inclinations. Of course, it's not that we train ourselves to hate all comfort, pleasure, and joy, as we've learned at this very assembly. Jehovah wants us to rejoice. He even tells us that rejoicing is at times accompanied by food and drink and that there are times to laugh and dance. But without Jehovah's Spirit operating in our lives, we might give in to what Paul refers to here as the things on the earth, excesses that appeal to the flesh. How do we win the battle? 
by keeping our minds on the things above. Jehovah, his Son, his Holy Spirit, the angels, the full realization of our hope, things unseen. For spirit-anointed ones, this means keeping their minds on their heavenly hope. For all of us, it means putting Jehovah and the kingdom first. Keeping Jehovah before us constantly will help us safeguard against Satan's attacks. And what will help us keep Jehovah before us constantly? That, dear friends, is our review question. Let's remind ourselves of the four key texts that we considered today. First, Romans 1.20, Jehovah's invisible qualities are clearly seen by the things made. So we keep Jehovah before us by paying attention to what he has made. Second, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, Jehovah's words must be on our heart, a reference to constant meditation on Jehovah's inspired word, the Bible. Third, uh, F uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, in everything, by prayer and supplication, along with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. Yes, keeping close to Jehovah in prayer. And finally, our fourth point, Psalm 16:3, Jehovah's holy ones bring me great delight. We choose friends who keep Jehovah before themselves constantly. Remember Psalm 16, written by David, but with an eye on the coming Messiah. Jesus kept Jehovah in mind constantly, and that brought Jesus abundant joy, joy that enabled him to endure a torture stake, despising shame, and for that, Jehovah rewarded him. This is our model. In this world of distraction, confusion, persecution, and revolution, where the rules and responses shift daily, keep Jehovah before you constantly. Keep pure worship at the very center of your life, and you will rejoice in Jehovah both now and forever. Thank you, Brother Schaefer, for that motivating talk helping us to focus on Jehovah and kingdom interests at all times. We certainly thank you and all the program participants today. Now we will conclude this upbuilding assembly by standing and singing song number seven entitled, Jehovah Our Strength. After the song, you may have your concluding prayer at your individual locations. That's song number seven. 